All right, hi, I'm Randy with uh, Keysight Technologies. I'm gonna give you some quick updates here on what we've been doing with the 5G multi-channel test bed. So the FCC in the United States has opened up spectrum in the 90 gigahertz plus regions, and I'm gonna show you the flexibility of the 5G test bed and how we can apply that to these next generation uh, wireless communications. So people are starting to want to do, uh, perform experiments there. Uh, 5G's already being rolled out and people are starting to think about the next thing. And so these tools will enable your customer to begin uh, experimenting uh, in these new, uh, in these new uh, spectrum allocations. So uh, to start, we're running Signal Studio on our VXG uh, signal generator. We have two channels that can be used for a lot of different things. Some of the key things for receiver test, we want to generate metrology grade signals, and typically we want to generate a wanted signal at a very low power level in the presence of a much higher power interfering signal that might be modulated or it might be CW with some specific frequency offset to that wanted signal. So the two channels are great for doing that. It's also great for doing investigations with um, uh, phased array chipsets where maybe you want to have a, a known reference path and you want to check other paths through that chipset and see how things are behaving as you're changing uh, maybe amplitude and phase shifting uh, to get uh, beams to point in different directions. And another example, which we're going to use in this demo setup, is to do uh, multiple layers for spatial multiplexing. So we're actually using Signal Studio to create a two-layer spatially multiplexed signal. So we're going to start with our uh, standards compliant 5G signal from Signal Studio that's a 100 megahertz component carrier. We're actually going to stretch that uh, to give us a bandwidth of almost two gigahertz. And we're gonna do this experiment at a center frequency of 105 gigahertz. This is also gonna give us a wider subcarrier spacing, which is also appropriate for the higher, uh, the higher frequencies. The two outputs are feeding a pair of VDI up converters. And we have uh, a pair, one for uh, vertical polarization and one for horizontal polarization. On the output of the up converters, you also see we have a filter to get rid of the unwanted image because we have both the uh, upper and lower mixing product. And then following the filter, we have an amplifier uh, to give us a little more gain because there's such high losses at these uh, millimeter wave frequencies. Oh, I should also make one more note uh, that we're using the PSG uh, microwave analog signal generator as the LO for uh, the VDI up converter. So we have this tuned to a uh, frequency of 50 gigahertz mixed with our five gigahertz IF is gonna give us a uh, one mixing product at 105 gigahertz, uh, which is the, the, the mixing product that we're gonna use in this experiment. You'll also notice that we're doing this in an anechoic chamber, right? So normally uh, this is how you'd wanna make measurements so you don't have any uh, unwanted reflections. And we're capturing this basically directly from the horn antennas with the UXR scope. There's not any extra down conversion being done or any amplification here on the receive side. We basically have uh, the horn antennas connected to a uh, waveguide to coax transition and then going directly into the scope. Now normally people think of a scope as a great time domain uh, analysis tool and you might think well how are we able to make uh, you know spectrum measurements using a scope. As you all know, the UXR scope has a sample rate of 256 giga samples per second. So it's that super high sample rate that's gonna give us the bandwidth. It's also that high sample rate coupled with the 10-bit analog to digital converters that are giving us near spectrum analyzer-like dynamic range. And so we really can make high quality, high quality metrology grade uh, measurements with this scope. On the scope screen, you can see the spectrum from the two channels. And there's actually four channels here. These are all natively phase coherent, which is another great uh, uh, benefit uh, for customers. So here we're just making use of two of them, but I could be doing uh, this with up to four channels. So nobody else on the, uh, uh, on the planet can do this. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the measurement results on the VSA display. So I've organized this in a way that makes sense to me. But of course, you're free to move these around any way that you want. And one thing that I'll show you is just let me place the spectrum here in uh, two different uh, graphs. So here you see the spectrum 
from layer zero or channel one, and here you see the spectrum from the second layer. Now I told you this was a MIMO signal or spatially multiplex signal, and those signals should be using the same time and frequency resources. But if you look at the spectrum here carefully, you would see that these do not look exactly identical. That's because I've tried to make this demo a little more interesting, and I'm using a combination of some channels using MIMO and some channels using SISO, just like a real base station would be in the real world. Now, I'm gonna make use of the feature where I can just take this uh, measurement and overlay it on top of the other one. And so now you see the green and the orange overlaid on top of each other. And I like to do that just so I can compare the relative levels to make sure that everything's balanced and is just like I want it to be. I also have a pair of band power markers on both of those that you can see down here. And so my power is just right about minus 31, minus 32 dB on both of those channels. So I feel pretty good about uh, everything set up right on the generator. Uh, both of the up converters are performing similarly and the losses uh, through all of the cables and everything is about the same, which is uh, what I like to see. And then I've also put here the CCDF curve and overlaid again channel one and channel two. And that's pretty important uh, for these 5G signals or you know next generation experiments for 6G and, and beyond where we have really high peak to average ratios and it gives you some idea, okay, is this what I'm expecting? Uh, how far do I need to back things off on uh, amplifier so I, you know, to avoid compression? And then I also like to see how the signals are laid out across time and frequency. So here I have the detected allocation graph for layer zero and layer one. And what you'll notice is, of course, they don't look the same. The layer zero looks a lot more dense and rich with stuff going on. And that's because I have my SISO and MIMO signals, where this one looks a lot more sparse. But you see the same orange shows up in the, in the same uh, part of the spectrum on layer zero and layer one. So that tells me this is my MIMO channel. The second layer actually didn't have any SISO channels, but the, uh, the first, or layer zero, uh, has the MIMO channel here, and then a couple of other SISO channels uh, spread out across uh, the bandwidth. And then you can see uh, over here the constellation for both layer zero and layer one. And of course the colors are coordinated so you can see, okay, I have a mix uh, in this example of BPSK for the sync channels, QPSK for the DMRS, a 16 QAM user, and a 64 QAM user, where the MIMO channel is a 16 QAM. And then, of course, everybody's interested in EVM, and uh, you can see the frame summary where you have a breakdown of the EVM by each of the individual channels. So you can read here, okay, here's PDSCH0, uh, uh, layer zero and layer one. I can see what the uh, EVM is. And then I have in the frame summary an overall composite EVM of both layers combined together over the whole measurement. And in this case, our EVM is right about 2.7%. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, hey, that's not a very good result. Everybody's used to these 1% uh, numbers with 5G. And you have to understand that we've taken our 100 megahertz component carrier signal where we have all of that energy focused uh, in that bandwidth and we've spread it out to give us that two gigahertz of bandwidth. So all of that power is spread out and as a result, the power spectral density is now lower. And so our signal's lower uh, or closer to the noise floor. And we also have uh, that, that high peak to average ratio. I think in this example, our, our uh, peak to average ratio is uh, right around 11 dB. So that's also causing us to have to back things off a little bit so that we don't uh, run the amplifiers into compression. And so our overall signal to noise ratio is lower than it would be in the classical uh, 100 megahertz 5G uh, component carrier. So this makes sense. So considering we're doing this at 105 gigahertz over 2 gigahertz of bandwidth, that's a pretty phenomenal uh, result uh, that we're getting here.
Okay, some other displays uh, that are interesting. Uh, of course, we have the uh, EVM as a function of uh, frequency and as a function of time. And in the middle here, we have our 3D view of power and how that's allocated across time and frequency. So how do you make sense of that? Well, uh, let me make it bigger. You can easily pull this out and make it full screen. And we can zoom in and I can rotate this any way that I want. I can zoom in to an individual subcarrier. I can put a marker on it if I want and find out what the symbol, what subcarrier that is and what its power level is if I'm interested. But let's orient the view like this and uh, see what we can learn about our signal. So on the x-axis we have uh, frequency, on the z-axis we have uh, power, and going into the screen on the y-axis we would have time. Now looking at it like this across frequency you can see that it looks like there's a little bit of a dip there. Our frequency response isn't flat. Normally we'd like to see that all of our signals are, are, are you know, have a flat response, but here clearly it's not flat. And we might wonder, well, why is that? And that's a good question. Uh, well, we are doing this over the air, so we, we do have um, you know, possible interference from other things. We also have a pair of amplifiers on the output of the upconverters that could be contributing uh, to this flatness. But it's tools like this that really enable you to uh, be able to quickly see that. Now you also might be thinking to yourself, hey, well, why do I see multiple copies of this signal and why are, you know, why are they like that? And the answer is, there's actually not multiple copies there, but this is a representation of what the 16 quantum signal looks like. So let's think about uh, our modulation for a second. If we thought about uh, QPSK modulation, QPSK modulation uh, obviously has four points, right? One, two, three, and four, and those are all equidistant from the origin. So those all have the same power because they're spaced uh, the same distance away from the origin. They all have different phases, but the uh, distance from the origin is the same. So QPSK is transmitted, all of the symbols are transmitted with the same power level. Okay, now if you thought about a more complex modulation like 16 quam, if you thought just about one quadrant of that, you would have four, four points. And you would notice that, okay, there's a point that's really close to the origin, so that's one power level. There's also a point really far away, so that's another high power level. And then you would see two points uh, to the sides, which have the same distance, but are between those other ones. And those represent a third power level. So those three power levels exist no matter what quadrant you're in, and that's what you're seeing here on the display. So this is 16 quam. So these are the constellation points that are very close to the origin. These are the two different constellation points that have different phases, and this is the one at the furthest reach. So that makes sense uh, when you see this. The middle part of the spectrum here that uh, has this green and the purple and the blue are the broadcast channels and the sync channels. Now the broadcast channel is transmitted with QPSK, and so uh, you see that there, everything spread out uh, in one plane, which makes sense. And you also see the, 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 the pink and the blue, which are the primary and secondary sync channels. Those are transmitted with BPSK, but of course those, those two have uh, the same distance from the origin. Uh, so that makes sense. And since we're doing this you know, um, over such a wide bandwidth, and we do have, uh, you know, there is a little bit of noise there in our signal. There is a little bit of spread in, uh, in, the, in the range of symbols there. Normally, if I did this with a uh, cable and had everything much better constrained, this would be much, uh, much flatter. And uh, so it's a, tools like this that really enable you to visualize what's going on with these complex signals where we have subcarriers that are packed tight, tightly together and um, are spread out across uh, time and frequency. So that's a really cool uh, measurement that we have in the VSA. I can click that X, it goes right back uh, to its position. And we've also added here in the display the three-dimensional view of EVM. So I can do the same thing here and see what the EVM is across uh, time and uh, frequency. Now here, 
it isn't obvious that there's any one part of the signal that's contributing to that EVM. So it, there's, there's not like, um, you know, one thing that we might want to focus on, but there could be. Maybe there is uh, something that's causing an issue and that might uh, become more apparent by looking at that graph. Uh, and then if we kind of scan over here to the lower uh, right, we have uh, the decoded symbols and uh, demodulated uh, data bits, which uh, can be useful for, for looking at uh, uh, more things. Like an example, we can, we can also uh, show if the CRC matches the data payload and how many of those blocks are actually uh, passing, uh, passing the result. You know, and also don't forget that all of these displays, most of these are color coordinated together. So what you see in one screen is coordinated to uh, the other screens as well. All right, so that's a quick update on our 5G multi-channel test bed. In a quick summary, what I've showed you is the, the VXG running the Signal Studio software. We're doing this with two layers uh, with a bandwidth of two gigahertz. We modified it using the flexibility of the software to get that two gigahertz of bandwidth. And then we mixed this up to 105 gigahertz center frequency and then did the analysis directly at that 105 uh, gigahertz uh, center frequency, which is pretty cool uh, considering you're doing that with two channels and uh, no extra down conversion stage is needed. All right, so I uh, hope you found that useful and uh, check back for more updates soon. Thanks for watching.